Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Very happy to welcome back somebody you might recognize, Mahesh Stapa. Mahesh, how are you today? What's going on? I'm great. Uh, ate too much for Mother's Day, as usual, uh, <laughs> but feeling good. I'm glad to be here. Excellent. The good, news, the good news is nobody can see us, so they don't that's know right. how much we ate and they don't know what we look like, except for like from the head and up. Right. So that's uh, I retain water, so it shows up on my face. <laughs> There you go. So he just, he just drank a lot of water yesterday, so That's don't right. hold it against him. But uh, Mahesh is joining us today. He's going to be talking about mobile photography. Want to give a huge thank you to our sponsors for this event and many others, Sony. So thank you to them. Uh, just a reminder to anybody who's joining us here, if this is your first time or maybe it's your hundredth time here, please feel free to get involved and engage with us. Ask any questions that you may have. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can use Q&A tab. If you're joining us on Facebook or Vimeo, you can use the comment section and we'll make sure to get them over to Mahesh. But otherwise, without further ado, I'm going to pass over the virtual microphone to Mahesh and uh, I'll see you back in a little bit. All right. Well, it's it's been a while, but uh, it's great to be here once again with, uh, with, with everybody. It's, it's like a little family we have going on here. And, you know, today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite subjects because I think it's becoming more and more popular uh, and not becoming, it has become more and more popular. Uh, and that's smartphone photography. This is a Sony sponsored event. So everything I'm going to talk about is going to be in relation to the Xperia lineup. I actually have brought three Xperia with me. I don't know if you can see them. The Xperia 1i, Xperia 1 Mark III, and the Xperia 1 Mark II. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have access to all of these machines uh, as I do my mobile photography. And like I said, everything I share today uh, will have been taken in one of these systems. Particularly, it's going to be the Xperia 1 Mark III because that's my personal favorite. I'll get, get into why uh, in, in a few minutes. This is going to be a similar format to others where a lot of it's going to be talking head like this. I'm going to show you some products that I use frequently with these uh, systems, uh, give you some tips about uh, why I use them, uh, why one is better than the other, other maybe, and share a few behind the scenes images and videos from me actually going out to the field and using this. Um, the video may be a little choppy because it's always a little funny over Zoom, but uh, hopefully you'll get the gist of what I'm trying to talk about. And if not, just ask me questions in chat. I'm more than happy to discuss it. I, you know, I'm here. I'm here for a while. These guys may have to leave in an hour, but uh, I'm here to answer questions if you need it. I'm going to start off by showing you a quick video, mainly because it's easier to show this as far as what case I use, what filters I use initially with this video. So let me just share the screen and show this little video. It's about five minutes long. Uh, so, so to be patient, there we go. So you should see a blank screen or a screen with my sort of folders of things I want to show you today. The first one is going to be this video one. And let's see how that, uh, let's see how that is. So I recorded this a while back, uh, just because in anticipation of what I wanted to share with you guys today. Today, I want to talk to you about how I use the Sony Xperia 1 Mark III as a tool for landscape photography. Now, it's not going to replace my a7R 4 or A1 or anything like that, but it is a great small camera phone system to have with you wherever you are. And it is a great supplementary device to your mirrorless camera. So I'm going to separate this talk, if you will, into three segments. First, I'm gonna to talk to you right now about the camera phone itself, the various accessories I carry around with it. Then we're gonna go into the field and I'm gonna show you some screencasts of the camera itself as I take the images. The thought process that I'm going through, what settings I'll be using, why I compose the image the way I do, and then finally I'm going to share my final thoughts about what I really like about the camera system. And along the way I'm going to be interspersing some images from the phone, maybe some screenshots of the devices that I talk about as far as the accessories and things like that. So let's get started. First of all, the camera system that I like to use obviously is the Sony Xperia 1 Mark III and here it is. And this actually has a case on it already. The case is made by a company called Spigen or Spigen, S-P-I-G-E-N. And I'll put a little image of it on after. Speaking of which, this is a filter adapter that I like to use. It's very simple, it's very cheap. Again, I'm gonna show you what it looks like on Amazon too. Use, 
And once you have that on there, you can go on and put on your filter threads. This one happens to take 37 millimeter filters. Speaking of filters, let me show you the filters that I carry. So I'm gonna pause that video right there and I'm gonna show you once again uh, that, that system and why I, I've sort of gone away from it a little bit. This is when I first got into these filters uh, and this is what it was. And I mentioned sort of available, availability on Amazon, but uh, let me just stop the share here real quick so you can see me. I mentioned the availability on Amazon, but it really is pretty cheap. And it, I had like three of them and they, and they broke easily, but I found one on B and H that's a little bit more robust. And I think uh, somebody's going to be putting links to all the stuff that I talk about in the chat section. So take a look at that. So basically what I like about these systems with the case is if you look at the case itself and, and the camera, it goes nice and flush against the camera and on the uh, and on the and on the case when you put these filter system on you put it right at the lens that you want to associate with it right when you do that there's virtually no gap between the case and the camera bump so that's really important to prevent light leaks from getting in and so that's really great for that but now i found something that's a little better actually it's a lot better and it's made by a very reputable company. Uh, you probably heard of it. It's called Nisi, N-I-S-I. And they have this P1 system. And I think um, there'll be a nice link to that uh, on the chat. And what I love about it is the, the clip itself is really, really well made. I'm going to unscrew this here. And here it is right here. It, it's polycarbonate and very, very hard. It's got a nice metal mount right here that screws on. And it has what looks like these the, the filter system that we're typically used to seeing on, on mirrorless systems or DSLRs, where you can actually put in or slide in square or, or uh, rectilinear uh, rectangular filters uh, in these systems. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So I have, for example, this is a polarizing filter. It's square. So you put the filter in one of these slots like this, and then you'd rotate it any way that you wanted once you've got this on here. So you take this clip, you'd, you'd put it on like this and you tighten it up. And once you've gotten it tightened up, you take this, put it on your camera system, whichever lens you wanna use. Let's say it's this one. And here is your filter system. And if you want to polarize it because it's free flowing or free moving, you just polarize it to the degree that you want. And not only that, now you can stack filters. So on this, if I wanted to add a grad neutral density filter, I have it. So this is a three-stop grad ND filter with the polarizer. I can go ahead and put it in the second slot how I want it. Like this. And now I've got this robust system that I would just like I'd use for my uh, Sony Alpha mirrorless system. And it's really, really great. And you can move it to any lens that you want along the side of your Xperia or, or whatever smartphone you happen to have. So I really like the system. What I like is you can get various different filters. You can get six stop, 10 stop ND filters. You can get polarizers, uh, graduate new density filters. So anything that you are able to do with your other camera system, your robust quote unquote real camera system, you can now do uh, with this filter system. So I really like that. You know, if you are still hung up on the traditional circular system, go ahead and get one of these. These are much less expensive. There's a link to um, a, a system that's actually a little better than this, but same sort of concept with the clip um, on, on B&H. And what's great about this system is you can carry circular filters like this. So this is a filter system made by a company called Gobi. I, I, I think I forgot, I forgot to list this, but you can easily find it on Amazon. And these are 37 millimeter filters. I've got a circular polarizer, six stop filter, ND filter, three stop, um, and 10 stop. The only disadvantage is you really can't do graduated neutral, graduated filters like you could on the, on the other system. Uh, you'll have to sort of blend exposures, uh, you know, lower exposure, higher exposure, and then blend those images together. Uh, to get uh, to get the desired effect you want. So 
I highly recommend this Nisi system. Uh, it's called the P1 system, if you can afford it. Uh, it's actually not that expensive. Uh, and if you just want to sort of start out experimenting with filters on your um, smartphone, then this is actually a pretty good system itself, just, just the circular filters uh, and these little cheap uh, filter adapters. Okay, and as you can see, I have all these little rectangular filters that I haven't even opened up yet. This is a uh, six-stop ND filter, and I even have a skylight filter <clears throat> for nighttime photography if, you wanna, if I want to get rid of some of the uh, um, light pollution. There's a night, night sky filter that, that that system uses, and it works really, really well. So that's what I use for my filters. I also mention in this video, let me just restart it again and share it, a, a few tripods, which you may be interested in. I'll show you some examples, some additional examples of that as we as we go through it. Um, very compact system filter. This is, if you want 10, 15, 20, this has a little spring mechanism that you can open. And I would These find are the holders my triggers are talking about now. for the shutter release. And I would put a slightly eccentric, like such, like this. And it opens up quite, quite nicely, just the size that you need. And then once you have it in place, you just lock it down. And what I like about this system is I can go ahead and rotate it in the portrait or landscape orientation, depending on what needs to be done. And there's enough clearance at the bottom that you can do so without any problems. Again, very, very solid. And once you have it in the position that you want, there's a little lever right here that you can go like this. And now it's completely solid. It's not moving, not moving anywhere. I'm gonna stop sharing right there. So that's what I initially used, this system right here. Uh, it's by a company called WOOHOD. This is, I think, no longer available, but of similar design is available on b and I think um, Ulanz, U-L-A-N-Z-I, that company makes something very similar, which I've tried out. It's also very, very robust. Again, what's really great about this system for me is it's got this locking mechanism that stops your, your thing from coming apart. So it's, so it's very secure. You loosen it, and then now you can open it up as much as you want and put your, put your system in. You can loosen that up, go like this. You can rotate it in the landscape or portrait orientation, however you like it. And it has this Arca Swiss mount right over here so if you have Arca Swiss ball head or whatever, you just flick, stick it in there, clamp it down, and it's very easy. And it's all metal, and it's really robust. So that's one option. Since then, I've tried a few others, and I want to share some of them with you, which I like, what I like, what I didn't like. So here, there you'll find several like this. Like here's one of them. This is a simple all metal construction. I think this is made by Loom, and it just goes like this. And this is sort of springs into place. You can put your phone right in here like this. And as long as the spring is good, it's strong, it'll hold it pretty well, particularly for landscape or, or portrait. I found that some of the cheaper ones, the springs get loose over time. And one time I almost, the phone actually almost slipped out. So I'm, I really feel a lot more secure with you know, a system like, like this where you can loosen this where you want it and then tighten it so it stays exactly where it is and it doesn't move back and forth. But if you have a nice robust spring system, then it's okay, but just take into account over time that spring may get loose and you're gonna have a very smart, uh, very, very uh, expensive smartphone that you could drop if it's just a spring system. This is another one, it's made by uh, Manfrotto. Again, a spring system, but as I sort of pull this out, I feel a lot more confident in the spring because I feel like there's a lot more tension here. So if you have a spring that's not so tense, then, then just be leery that, that, that it may not be holding the phone the way you like it. Another one that I've come to like a lot is this one by Joby. Okay, and again, the, the thing is I can, I can loosen this back here, control exactly how I want it. And oftentimes something like this, it opens up so wide that it accommodates a lot of the even bigger phones. So once you're done, you tighten it down. There's no spring system involved. So it, it's nice and easy to just 
keep it where you want it. And you can even sort of loosen this how you want it and then put it in landscape or portrait orientation, however you want it. This part over here will go into uh, your tripod or your ball head and it's a nice system and it's, and it's somewhat plasticky, uh, somewhat metal. Uh, so it has a nice combination of robustness and lightweight. So I really like this made by Jovia. So I've used this extensively also. Uh, all great for your smartphone. Uh, there are two other ones that I want to mention, and they look very similar, but they're actually not. So this is it right here. What? So basically, let me show you the one that I really like. And that's the one that I sort of linked uh, in, um, in the chat. This is the one... This company is called Alum, A-I-L-U-M, but the one I linked, I think it's made by Ulanzi, also just as good, uh, very, very similar product. And what I like about this is the bottom is actually a Arca Swiss type, so you don't need any other adapters to put it onto your ball head. And this piece of plastic and this piece of plastic are very heavy duty. So when I try to move it, there's no play or give here whatsoever. If you get a very cheap off-market one, something like this. It looks very similar to what I just showed you, but look how much play there is. This plastic here is very, very thin and it's not that robust at all. So there's a lot of movement in this particular part right here of the plastic. So that's not very good, okay? And there's no Arca Swiss type of dovetail over here. So you can't easily put it on a tripod. You'd have to get a little tripod plate and put that in. So try to avoid, you know, off-brand, stuff like this because you know there you do get what you pay for the one that i linked for you on bnh is even better than this one because this portion here is made of aluminum so it's completely robust completely uh, uh completely well made okay and one last one i want to show you is this one so this one is very small very lightweight all metal and again, I love the system because it's not, it doesn't rely on springs. It just relies on the screw system. So you just unscrew it like this and you make it as, as big as you want. And like the other ones, uh, uh, you adjust it how you want it. And then once you get it to where you are, you tighten it down on your phone, no loose springs to worry about. It just clamps right on. It also has a nice hot shoe. So if you wanted to add a light or a microphone, you could do that on this. The only downside for me with this is there is no Arca Swiss type of plate at the bottom. So you'd have to attach a tripod plate and then attach it to a ball head to get it. But it's so small and so compact and lightweight. Again, this is also made by Ulanzi and I'll, and I'll love to link um, on BNH for that. So this is also great. So which is my favorite out of all of them? Um, well, you know, I think my favorite is, is the Joby because I really like the system, how wide this opens up. One turn adjusts both uh, the landscape and, and portrait orientation. And it also adjusts how wide this holder gets. So I really like this one knob system. Uh, this goes right onto your tripod uh, ball head. You don't actually even need a ball head with this. You can just screw it onto a, a regular tripod. So that really works well. Okay, so those are the holders. So let me go back to the video and I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the tripod or tripods that I like. Let me share this. This mounting just looked at the size of the phone in relationship with the tripod. This is about maybe a phone and two thirds length when it's very compact. It's really, really small, really, really right, lightweight. This is a Siri travel tripod and there's a link for that uh, on, the, on the BNH website. Uh, I've since moved away from this tripod, but this is still a great tripod to use, I think. And I'll show you the one that I'm using right now uh, in a few seconds. And it's, I think, made of carbon fiber. So it's very sturdy too. Works really, really well. As far as the ball head, it's something very inexpensive, like this very simple ball head like this, very thin because you don't need anything fancy. You just need something that can rotate a little bit here and there. And this is what I happen to use right here. Uh, again, I'll put an image of this from Amazon. And on top of this ball head is where I would go ahead and screw on my uh, mount, like so. And I'm just gonna show you really quick as I do this. 
and there we go. And that's how it stands. And I could again make it into orient any orientation that I want and lock it in place like this. And it's perfect. So now we have this system that I can carry very, very easily in a fanny pack or a tiny backpack or what have you. So, okay. And stop sharing there. So we talked about filters, we talked about holders, and we're now sort of at tripods that I like to use. The more I go out and do mobile photography, the, the less I want to carry with me. So one of the biggest things that sort of weighed me down is the tripod. The one I just talked about, the, this Traveler model from Siri is excellent. It's great. But, you know, when I go do photography, it, my mobile phone is one of the things I have with me, but I also have my uh, full camera gear too, just in case there's something that I really need to capture uh, for, for products or, or for la later resale or what have you. And for that, I have this tripod. Let me show you. It's this one right here. It's make, made by Peak Design. Now, this is not that cheap, but it's actually not that expensive relative to other carbon fiber tripods. And look how compact it is. So I'm going to show this to you relative to the size of the phone. Okay, so here's the size of the phone. So one, one phone, two phones. So it's a little over two phone sizes is this tripod. It fits into the smallest of backpack. It's not that heavy. It, it folds out to a completely full-size tripod and it uses the Peak Design system, the plates that I use for my other cameras and that I can adapt for my, for my uh, cell phone. The really selling point for me with this is the fact that it actually holds in the bottom a mount for your phone. So you just, all you have to do is take this and pull it out and you'll see this little device right here. This little device is actually a mount for your phone that fits onto the top of the mount on the tripod over here. So let me show you really quickly what that looks like. And look how tiny it is, tiny thing like this, it's crazy. So it comes up like this. Now it is spring loaded, so you have to watch out and, you know, but the, the spring is very robust. I have lots of confidence in the spring system. So you take your camera, and you put it just like this. And the width of the bottom right here is just enough right here, this thing, that it will fit on the top of the tripod. So the tripod will hold it just like this over here and it'll be completely secure. So this is a great system. And if you wanna carry something tiny, really light, that tripod and this little device that comes with the tripod that fits on the underside of that tripod is perfect. So that's a second option. That's what I'm carrying mostly right now, because like I said, I take other gear with me uh, along with, with my Xperia. Now, if you really want to go even lighter weight than that, then there's several tabletop tripods that I've tried out that I'd really like. I'm going to go over a few of those with you now. The first one is this Manfrotto Pixie, right? Very simple, very lightweight. I love this one button system that it has. So you press this button, and now this completely turns however you want it. I love the fact that you can do that. And when you're done positioning it, you just release that button and it holds there very, very steady. It doesn't get very long, but for most situations, you know, if you want to go really lightweight, this is a great little tripod, I think. Now it has an older brother. If you want a little bit, little bit more height, a little bit more adjustment capability. And it is this one also made by Manfrotto. You notice the legs are a little longer, okay? And it comes completely flat down if you want. So you can get really, really low to the ground. It also has a much better uh, holder on top for your camera. You can put a ball head, it's a lot more robust. Uh, it has this, again, one button or one, one rotator system. You can put it any way you want. So it's a little bit more robust. It takes a little bit more room in your in your bag, but it's actually not that much heavier than the little brother. And one other trick it has up its sleeve, you could take this, you could take the legs and actually extend it out even longer. So it goes out a little longer if you want. And you could you could adjust the tension here where you go like this and you, you put it and it locks 
either completely flat like this, or if you, if you put it down here, only a certain amount. So you could adjust how much this leg goes out based on this little lever over here. So this is also great. If you, if you don't mind carrying something that's a little bit bigger, uh, I think it's a little bit more versatile than just the original Pixie uh, that I showed you. So this is also great. A couple of others before I, uh, before I stop. Here's one, and this is made by a company called Coleman, but uh, this is not available on B&H, but there's another company on B&H that's the exact copy of this. And this is a nice robust carbon fiber. This tiny thing is carbon fiber and it comes out pretty, pretty big if you look at this. And the, and the mechanism is so smooth. You can tell that it's really, really well made as you sort of put this out. And it, there's also a center column that you can attach if you wanna make it a little longer. I have attached a ball head. The ball head uh, doesn't come with this tripod. You may have to get another buy hot, but they may actually have a little package deal where you can get the ball head and this tripod, but this is great. And what I really like about this is at the, at the legs of the tripod, I don't know if you can tell it's a little, there's a little rounded silver thing here. Here you can attach extensions. So if you have a little light or a microphone, there are three extensions you can attach to the very proximal aspect of these legs. Uh, and so for lights, tripods, what have you, and it serves as a great way of adding accessories to your tripod without having to carry a second or third tripod if you don't want to. So that's, that's really good. So depending on what I'm doing, sometimes I take this. This is really great for macro work, for example, if you have ring lights um, uh, or what have you uh, to shine on your object. And one final tripod I wanna show you. And I'm not sure there's an equivalent of this on, uh, on B&H, but I got this recently. It's a little longer, as you can see, but and it doesn't completely come to a normal tripod's height, but this is also made of carbon fiber, comes with its own ball head, and it gets much longer than any of the smaller tri tripods that I showed you before. Uh, not all the tabletop tripods. It doesn't get longer than the, uh, than the Peak Design, but it gets pretty long. And you can actually add an extension. It comes with an extension. You can make this go a little taller like this. So this comes up to probably my uh, the the top, the top, the bottom of my shoulders, like so about here, once it's all extended. So if you don't need a full size tripod and if the travel tripods are a little bit too small, then this is a great alternative for you, okay? So filters, filter holders, cases, uh, mounts and tripods. So those are the major accessories that I take. Now, what bag do I take? So the bag that I like to use is this one, let me show you. This little bag like this. This holds basically my Sony a7R4 and a single lens along with all the little filters and, uh, uh, and little table tripods. Uh, and I can attach the big tripod back down over here. And this is just a sling, Peak Design sling. I think it's the smallest one that they have. I think it's the 10 liter one. And, and I can put this over my shoulder have the complete system, including my Xperia. So this is the bag you know, I've used for a long time and I continue to use if I wanna go super light and super mobile. So those are all the different uh, accessories, if you will, that I like to travel with. Now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna take you behind the scenes. The audio is not so great because uh, it was next to a waterfall uh, and other words next to uh, a busy, uh, busy picnic area, but I wanna show you a few uh, screen capture, screen capture videos of the Xperia system as I was taking the images and sort of walk you through my thought process of capturing the shots. Just to give you an idea that at least for the Xperia system and many Androids out there, I think uh, it really is a camera system in itself. You know, it's, it's, it's not just a point and shoot thing anymore. So I'm going to close this one and I'm going to bring up this movie here. And so this is the actual Xperia screen. This is what I was using at Mount Rainier National Park, uh, one of the waterfalls there. And I'm gonna sort of walk you through the process of capturing this and why I chose a certain focal length. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that. 
And like I said, this is the actual screen capture of the Xperia 1 Mark III. Okay, here we are in front of an awesome waterfall at Mount Rain National Park. Please forgive the audio. The waterfall is supremely loud. Now I'm doing the best I can to get as good of an audio source as possible, but let's see how it works. So here you can see that I am in P mode and I am at 60 millimeters. I really don't like the composition. I want a little bit more intimate view of the waterfall. So let's just see what the other lenses look like. At 24, that's looking actually pretty good, but I don't like that very bright spot at the top over here. But I am going to go one more. Let's go to 70 millimeters. And I really like this composition. I really I just coming from the upper right hand corner. Everything flows nicely down this way. Uh, just for the sake of argument, the completeness, let's see what the 105 looks like. And that actually isn't that not bad either, but it's just a little bit too close. But we could tie this composition how we like it. But I think I like the 70 millimeter best. And at this point, let's go and choose the manual shooting mode by choosing M. And then I'm going to make sure that shutter speed is as low as possible. And I'm going to just change the shutter speed. And I have the histogram displayed right here. The histogram is uh, very valuable to let me know how my exposure is because sometimes the screen may be not quite as accurate. So I'm going to decrease the shutter speed until the exposure looks about right. I don't have any influence over the aperture, but I can control the shutter speed. And I like my shutter speed for waterfalls between a half a second and two seconds, but it looks like at about one fiftieth of a second or even one sixtieth of a second, that gives me about as good exposure as I can get. Let's just take a picture and see how that looks. It's on a tripod, three seconds, it's gonna count down and take a picture. And it took the picture, and let's see what that looks like. Okay, so let me show you exactly what that picture was in a bigger format. Uh, I think it's, is it this one? No. Yeah, it's this one. So you notice, you know, it's, it's, it's a fine picture, but I just don't like the effect on the water here. You know, I wish either it was a very fast shutter speed, so I have a nice droplet appearance of, a, of you know, the actual water, or the shutter speed was a little longer, uh, so it, it smooths out the water effect a little more. So I decided to go with the latter. I decided to make the water a little smoother, and let's go back to the video uh, and show you what happened. And, uh, you know, I don't like the texture of the water. So what I'm going to do is change my exposure by putting an ND filter in front of the lens. So I'm going to pause the video here. And so now what I've done is I've gone back and, and put an ND filter on. And let me show you the video associated with that. Now I have a six stop ND filter on. And this completely black because my shutter speed is still at one sixth of a second. I'm gonna increase the shutter speed or actually decrease it, make it longer and see how it looks. So I'm gonna go this way and you can see the waterfall slowly beginning to appear at about one fifth of a second. It looks like that, one third, 0.6, 0.8, so 0.8 looks like it's going to be pretty good. I'm going to try to take a picture here and see how it turns out. Three second timer. And here it is processing the image. Let's take a look and see how it is. Okay, so now let me show you what that picture looked like. Nope. Yeah, so here it is. So here's that picture with an ND filter placed. Uh, you get this nice smooth effect. So the way I worked through that was the way I'd work through any camera system that I was carrying, whether it's a DSLR or mirrorless. And now with uh, something like the Xperia or, or really any Android system, uh, you could be a real photographer. You don't have to rely com completely on computational photography. It takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of effort, but I've captured this in pure raw format. I can go and mess around with the shadow detail. I can, I can change the white balance. I can bring highlight detail back. I am in complete control over the creativity of the shot. And, you know, from the composing of it by choosing the particular focal length that I thought worked for the scene, 
uh, to deciding what shutter speed to use. You know, having a histogram there was invaluable knowing that, oh, you know what? The screen is a little bright or the sun is a little bright and I can't see the screen very well. Is it really exposed correctly? But having a histogram there telling you exactly what the uh, exposure distribution is, is crucial to getting the right exposure in camera and not having to mess around too much um, in post-processing. Uh, being able to put a strong ND filter and still adjust the scene so that you can see the preview, that's, that's, you know, that takes a lot of horsepower and that takes a lot of nits on your brightness. So one good thing about the Xperia system is it can get really bright and it can compensate for these um, very uh, dark ND filters. Uh, being able to go to manual and choose the exact shutter speed, uh, the ISO, and in certain situations, you can even cho choose the aperture depending on the lens and camera system that you have. And, and I just like the whole, you know, the experience of, of capturing the image the way I, I'm used to capturing with a regular camera system. Okay. So now I'm going to show you one more, one more video. And close that, bring this up. And for this, I went to an area called Mukilteo. All right, here's the composition I really like. Uh, you can't tell from the way it's framed right here in this video, but I've got the Xperi 1 Mark III right over here, and I took a little sample shot. Not sure if you can see that screen or not, but it frames the lighthouse on the right-hand side. There's a little bit of empty room on the left, and I think a ferry is going to go right through that area. We have a few wispy clouds in the sky, and now it's just a matter of waiting for the light to get perfect and the highlights to get dimmed a little bit, some shadow details to come up, and then uh, wait for our shot. So let's see how it looks. Let me show you how that looked. So again, here's the screen capture from the, from the Experium 1 Mark III itself. All right, so here we are all set up. Uh, this is the framing I think I like. There's a lighthouse on the right, and you can't really tell right now at this exposure level, but this is the body of water over here, and right up here, where that dot was, there's where Mott Baker is. Not sure how well that's going to show up, but we have a nice few wispy clouds up here in the sky. And right now, I have set the exposure such that the highlights aren't blown. Uh, but let me just show you some of the shadow detail that you know, we have, and we could preview that by decreasing the shutter speed in the manual setting. So as I decrease the shutter speed, you notice that. There's some beautiful flowers here, red flowers, some uh, green grass. And right about here, I'm hoping, is where the ferry will come through. And as it comes through, I'll take a few pictures. Right now, you can see a little bit of it at the corner over here. It's docked. So as it's passing through or another one comes through, it's going to hopefully go right here and add to our composition, leading our line directly to the lighthouse. But Another great thing about having these manual features for me is being able to really see in real time the shadow detail, the highlight details as I change the shutter speed. I want to change the full, put the focus spot over there. And also, this allows me to do some bracketing. For example, I could take an image at this point where the highlights are really well controlled, but the shadows are a little bit too dark. So for example, I could take a picture here, and I have a three second timer on a tripod we take that image and then I increase the shutter speed to maybe something like like this where I have a little bit more shadow detail and I take the picture again and just like I would with an alpha system uh, a mirrorless camera I could take those two exposures and combine them later in Lightroom or Photoshop to and so let me show you exactly what I did there so I took those images those those uh... So here is the overexposed image. And here is sort of the ex exposure uh, for the highlights. So underexposed, overexposed. And here's a blended image where I can get nice detail on the shadows and the highlights. Uh, and because these were captured in raw uh, and all the photons that are necessary, so there's absolutely no noise in the shadow. I can really boost that shadow up as much as I wanted to. Uh, so you could either do it as a computational photography where the camera itself decides to take it at different ISO values, shutter speeds, or you could spend the time and do it yourself the right way and really get, and you can actually even see Mount Baker, if you can tell on this, is right over here. So I took another shot 
with the fairy that had come in. And so here it is, here's the composition that I wanted with the fairy coming in. And yet I was still able to maintain the highlights because I had taken one exposure earlier, right? Because, because of the, of the lower, um, with a faster shutter speed, and I was able to blend it with the, with the fairy that came in. So here's another example. Here is a exposure where I took three different exposures, uh, one for the highlights in the sky, uh, one for the sort of the shadow detail in the very dark areas, and one for some of the areas that are darker, but not quite as dark as the very deep shadows. To give you an idea, uh, here's another one uh, taken with the telephoto lens uh, from the camera where I was able to focus on the bird and you still get a nice view of Mount, uh, Mount Baker. And here's another one, lower light. Uh, I control the shutter speed myself, so I knew that I had to increase the shutter speed a, a little bit more. And this is sort of what I came up with. I wanna show you a couple other behind the scenes stuff and images. So my good friend Reza Melieri was with me as I, as I got some of these behind the scenes and he, he took these shots of me using the camera. But, the, but for example, here I am at Solduck Falls, uh, a full-fledged tripod. I've got that different mounting system on. You can notice over here, I've got the filter system, um, the, the cheap uh, threaded filter system over here. And I'm pointing to exactly where I want the focus to happen. Uh, and because of the filter system, I'm prolonging the exposure and that resulted in this image. So this image was taken with the Xperia system um, uh, at Soldox Falls. And you know, I would, I would you know, challenge anybody to tell the difference between this uh, and a, one taken with um, a, a full-fledged mirrorless system. Uh, here's another one uh, at one of the lighthouses and I'm just simply hand-holding it because you know, the camera system has an ultra-wide angle lens, a standard lens, uh, a mild telephoto and a, in a, in a, in a, a medium telephoto at 100 millimeters, I can choose whatever composition I want. Uh, and so here's another example of an ultra wide view of that, of that beautiful lighthouse. Uh, you can see a couple of ducks over here. Uh, the colors are rich, didn't have to do anything uh, very much to it. Here's another example of uh, a waterfall with the tripod uh, in place, my Xperia here. And given this, I was able to create these swirls with the long exposure in the foreground. So again, I would, I would ask anybody to tell us between something like this and something taken with a quote unquote real, real camera. Mobile photography is here, it's here to stay. And I think if you have a little bit of patience, you can create some, some amazing stuff, uh, amazing stuff with it. And finally, uh, this was taken with a slight telephoto uh, lens on that Xperia uh, One Pro and uh, Xperia 1i, yeah, Pro 1i. Uh, and look at the gradient of colors, right? No filters were used here. Uh, it's just taken with that beautiful one inch sensor. It has a lot of dynamic range. So these are some of the possibilities and, and some of the advice I have for you guys with, uh, with, the, uh, with the mobile system. So we're at about 12.45. You guys must have some questions for me. So I wanna, I want to open it up to questions about <clears throat> recommendations, equipment, filters, settings, whatever you like. I mean, no holds barred. No holds barred. I like it. Mahesh is open for business. It's open season. So if you have questions for him and you just want to put him on the spot and see the man sweat, go for it. <laughs> drop, a, drop a question in the comment section on Vimeo or Facebook and a Q&A tab on the Zoom that didn't come out right, but you guys understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, so let's start off. Uh, let's start off with the easiest stuff, and then we'll work our way into maybe some more difficulties. Um, we got a question here, just in terms of the accessories that you mentioned. Um, are those are those specific to? I know you mentioned that you have three of the Xperia line cameras. Are those exclusive to just those cameras, or will they work pretty much universally with just about any smartphone, all the Sony line stuff? Um, any any like stipulations there? Anything that might yes. Yeah, so so that that's an excellent question. So there, it, it doesn't matter what camera system you're using. You know, you know whether it's Samsung or Sony or Apple or whatever whatever have. But there is one limitation to some of these filter systems, and it it's mainly due to the design of the camera system versus the filter itself. So for example, uh, can you guys see this? This is the Xperia One Pro. You notice how the camera system is in the center, right? So if I try to take that filter system and put it on, it's not gonna to get to all the lenses. 
what I like, that's, and so I remember I, I sort of forgot to mention, I said, why I like the Xperia 1 Mark III system the best out of all the Xperia. One reason is just the placement of the cameras. The placement on the Xperia 1 Mark III is along the side. So every single lens here, you can use any type of filter system because it's easy to put exactly where you want it, okay? Another reason I like, I like the Xperia 1 Mark III is because it has four native lenses. It has the 60 millimeters, 24 millimeters, 70 millimeters, and the 105. These are not you know, digital zooms. These are optical lenses that are, that are in there. So I, I love, basically you've got 16 to 105 uh, system in your pocket. So that's, those are the main reasons. But as far as your question for the filters, you could use the, any camera you want, iPhone, whatever, as long as the design of the camera on the, on the phone accommodates the filters. Awesome. Excellent. So good news for those out there. Now we did get a question related to rewatching the event. And uh, just in case you are interested, this goes for all events, just by the way, in case anyone's wondering if you want to rewatch this event or any of our events, you can go to vimeo.com slash BH event space and rewatch it there. You can visit us on Facebook and go to Facebook and just search for BH event space and watch it there. Whatever your preferred method is, either of those would work. And uh, pretty much our whole entire catalog, you could watch Mahesh's previous content that he's come on and, and provided us with. So lots of, lots of options over there. Now we do have a question here from Myrna who wants to ask about uh, infrared phone photography, any suggestions for what to use to, to do infrared phone photography? Well, I'm assuming it's strictly for the sort of mobile mobile system, right? I mean, um, uh, so I've, I've, I've dabbled a little bit with infrared and I've used infrared filters. Unfortunately, the sensors are so small. And when you put an infrared filter on these cameras, the times take so long that it's very hard. Infrared photography is possible, but it's not worth it because like I said, the sensors are so small. Even the wide end sensors are pretty small. And when you, by the time you put these, these filters on, they, they inhibit so much light from getting into the sensors <clears throat> that everything becomes super grainy. So possible, yes. Advisable, I think no. There you have it. There's, there's the answer. <laughs> now, uh, now, Mark is joining us on Vimeo and wanted to ask, uh, are those focal lengths virtual, namely the 35 millimeter equivalents? So the, there, on the Xperia 1 Mark III, there are four native focal lengths, 16, 24, 70, and 105. So anything between that's not one of those fours are digitally assumed. So in other words, a 35 would be a 24 millimeter that's zoomed up a little bit. You know, so there's some digital, digital cropping going on to create the 35 millimeters. Awesome. Now, one last question that comes in, and I think this applies just overall, not just camera specific, but any tips for anybody out there using a smartphone that, that you didn't, that you didn't give us anything you're leaving out here, anything you're holding back, Mahesh? Uh, you know, so I try to be as exhaustive as possible. Uh, but I, th I think that the, so you have to decide how you want to take pictures. That's my big, it's like, do you want the camera to do most of the work? Uh, so in which case you rely on computational photography, you'd be, you'd be able to point the camera at night and get a nice, or <clears throat> do you want to do some work yourself? I think if you do a little bit of work yourself, <clears throat> you're going to be rewarded a lot more because one, you'll have a greater appreciation for the image that you took. Uh, and two, I mean, if you do proper technique, use proper technique, the quality of the images coming from your smartphone, if you do it manually, it's gonna be so much better than an automatic because you get to choose your own ISO, you get to choose your own shutter speed uh, and you could choose what kind of filters you want. It won't be a digital filter. So my advice really is, is to try to practice doing regular photography on your smartphone like you would do on a, on a regular DSLR or a mirrorless system. Awesome. And I think, I think that's what, you know, if, if, if I've, if I've taken anything away from, from the past couple of, you know, mobile, mobile photography uh, events that you've hosted is we're not limited anymore by our phones. It used to be, I mean, 
I'm old enough. I can date myself and I can remember where, where cell phones didn't even have cameras. And, yeah. and that was a thing of the future and a thought of like, wow, this is, this is groundbreaking. And I remember when they first came out with the, the 0.2 megapixels and we were, we were infatuated and, and blown away. So, I mean, the fact that now we have the ability to control everything on certain cameras manually and adjust aperture and shutter speed really, really doesn't limit us to, to what we can do. And, and so, you know, if, if all you have is your phone, there's no excuses anymore. Go yeah. out there and shoot. And, and the true nirvana is when you can harness the power of computational photography and still utilize all the manual features, then it, it's, it's, it becomes, it becomes limitless what you can't do. That's it. Now let's, let's, let's bring this baby home with this last question here. Besides the 105 lens, what do you like about the one three versus the pro I or the one, I, one three I, sorry, maybe I messed yeah. up. Right. <laughs> One, it's ex less expensive. <laughs> That's always, a, I'm, you know, it's, it's always, always a plus. It's less expensive. Uh, like you mentioned, the four lenses for me is a huge thing. And the placement of those lenses are really great for me. You know, I use a lot of filters uh, for, for what I need to, because rarely do I just take an image, you know, I sometimes use a polarizer, sometimes I use grad ND filters. Um, and one thing I love about, about the Xperia 1 Mark III and even the Mark II is that the placement of the lenses are at the side. So I'm not limited to just using one or two of the lenses with the filters. I can use any lens I want uh, with the filters. And, and, you know, again, with proper technique, you can overcome the limitation of a slightly smaller sensor. You know, uh, you use a tripod and you, you shoot a lower ISO, but exposure time a little longer. You get just as clean images. So you can work with the limitations. Uh, so that's 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 why I like the that model the best. Got it. Now, now I did have some clarification from Mark who asked that question uh, about the focal lens. He said uh, the question wasn't clearly stated. So the 16 millimeter lens yields a photo that a 16 millimeter would on a conventional 35 millimeter DSLR, and the 105 is a telephoto with the same effect on a 105 would on a one on a 35 as well. Correct. Absolutely correct. There we go. So we got that squared away, Mark. So you are you are completely on par. So I do want to thank you again, Mahesh, for being here. I want to thank Sony for sponsoring this event and all the past ones we've we've had you on here for and doing. So thank you to them as well. And of course, everybody at home, thank you for joining us. But that's all we've got for today. This has been another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time.